I have a very fond place in my heart for this community, so it is always such a pleasure and a joy to be able to come here. You live in an astoundingly gorgeous place, but the community is even better, right? There's something about who you all have chosen to be to each other and to visitors like me that just makes coming here so delightful. There's almost this homecoming aspect of coming to visit PCC. So thank you for allowing me to be here. And there's something incredibly special about being here for baptisms. Um, I, you know, every church does things differently, but I thought that was so beautiful. And it was really exciting to be a witness to youth who are saying, I understand the relevance of Bible, community, church, God in my life. And that was such an extreme privilege to be able to see. So I was so glad that I got to witness that. Today in our uh, sermon, we're going to meet two sisters. So this is Mary and Martha. We find their story in Luke chapter 10. I really love these sisters. Um, I myself am a sister. And I get along very well with my sisters, so we have a really nice relationship. I, in the past, have been somewhat irritated with the interpretation of this story because people often pit one sister against the other sister. I'm always like, that's so not fair to make one the courageous one, one the curious one, one the busy one, one the, you know, not going after Jesus one. Like, which truthful female are you going to be? You know, I was always like, that doesn't ring true. And the more I've studied, and of course, I'm like, I am so geography focused, context focused. I want to know the cultural context. And so that's what we're going to do today. I want to invite you into maybe seeing these two sisters in maybe a more nuanced way. Some of what you've heard about them, some of what we've thought about them in the past, that might be true, but they may just be a little bit more complex than we sometimes give them credit for. And so that's what I'd like to do. Now, this particular story of Mary and Martha, these two sisters, they have a brother. His name's Lazarus. He's just nowhere to be found in this text. You, mean you have to go to a completely different gospel to even see that he is mentioned. The assumption there is, and I'll just, it's an assumption. The assumption is that he's quite a younger brother. Like he's not the one in charge of the household. Martha is in charge of the household. She was probably the oldest sister. And we know she is the one inviting Jesus into the house. So she seems to be the one in charge of hospitality. So Lazarus, off to the side. We don't need him for this story. So we really are just looking at the two sisters. This particular story is only in Luke, which means we should ask the bigger question. Who is Luke? What is Luke doing? In the four Gospels, if Luke has a very unique story, why is it unique to Luke? And why does it fit into Luke's way of painting a portrait of who Jesus is in this gospel. So a couple things that are really interesting about Luke, Luke includes more women in his gospel than any of the other gospels. So the fact that we have a story with two women in it isn't actually all that weird for Luke. So that's not a flag to go, ooh, weird story, like, you know, we feel uncomfortable. It's not that at all because Luke includes women from chapter one to the very end of the gospel. Luke also has a really interesting style. Luke likes to pair people together. So if you think even just from the very beginning of Luke, we have Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they're paired together. We have Mary and Joseph, and they're paired together. We get Mary singing a song and Zechariah singing a song. We get, when you go to the temple, we have Simeon in the temple, and we have Anna in the temple. And if you pay attention throughout the entirety of the gospel, we have paired characters together. And that is part of what Luke is doing. When he pairs people, he doesn't say, one's good, one's bad. It is, we're seeing two different lenses of something we can learn from. So when we have two, it's not contrast, it's two to learn nuance. 
And so we have to remember that that is what is going on in the book of Luke before we even get to our chapter in chapter 10. So a couple other things culturally. Men and women do have separate roles in society, but they're not nearly as separated as we often interpret them to be, especially in first century Jewish culture. Everyone participates in the household. Now, of course, there's going to be specialized tasks, right? Like only women were midwives, only women were wet nurses. Like some of these things make sense. Women raised the super, super tiny children, Right, But women and men worked in the fields. Women and men bought and sold in the marketplace. They were very visible in society. And I just think that's a really good thing to keep in mind because sometimes we go, what, like when we're reading ancient texts, we tend to think of women's space and male space. And people do that all the time with this passage. And it's not really authentic to the cultural context. So we're gonna kinda scrub that out of the way that we're approaching this text. Another thing to recognize in this first century context in particular, education was prioritized. And this is education for everyone, girls and boys. From the time they were five, both girls and boys went to the synagogue to study the Torah. So education was at the core of their identity, the core of what they were allowed to do, the core of what they were told they were supposed to do and supposed to be. And even as girls and boys kind of separate out into life, into different roles, education was always a priority. So the rabbis even have a saying. And they talk about, if we go to the next slide, it says, let your house be a meeting place for the sages and sit in the very dust of their feet. Right? So embedded into just the general Jewish culture was when a rabbi comes through, you should be so hungry and thirsty for their teaching about Torah that you vie for the honor of opening up your doors and inviting them into your house. And then when they do, sit and learn from them. This is not a passive learning either. It's not like the context we're currently in where I'm talking and you're sitting there looking at me. This is not first century Jewish context at all. They were taught from the time that they were children to ask questions, to debate, to enter into conversation. It was an active learning. So it was an opening up the scrolls, either quoting things from memory or examining what scripture said. And then it was, what do you think? What questions do you have? Do you think the same thing? What about that? Does it relate to this other portion of scripture? It was a very active and engaging kind of way to encounter the scriptures. And so when we see Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, we have to think of her sitting at the feet of Jesus, not in a passive way, but in an active way, because it would have been the same with all the other people. So we're prioritizing education. We're prioritizing hospitality, especially to a rabbi or a leader. And we're prioritizing an active engagement with scripture. Another thing that we should do contextually, um, I have to show a map because that is embedded in my DNA. So where are we going to be for this story? We're going to be in Bethany. And so Bethany is about three kilometers to the east and a little bit south of Jerusalem. So we can switch to the map next. So I know these, these pinpoints might be a little hard to see, but you have Jerusalem on the left, you have Bethany almost in the middle of your screen, and Jericho is way off to the right, just as a point of reference. That's where Jesus is walking up from. We have the Rift Valley going up and then the Sea of Galilee all the way up in the north. So this is really interesting because Jesus is at this point in Luke, he's in the middle of a travel narrative. So Luke from chapter nine to chapter 19 has Jesus walking along the way. And is the map going to move if we do the next click over? I'm not sure. It may or may not move, just to like be kind of fun. Um, so Jesus is coming from Galilee. He goes down to Jericho. From Jericho, they climb up the mountain. And before getting to Jerusalem, they stop in Bethany. 
And this is the first time in Luke that we have Jesus stopping in Bethany at the house of Martha. However, if we read through all of the Gospels, we will see that very regularly when Jesus goes to Jerusalem, he stays with Mary and Martha. This becomes his, like, you know, they have their hospitality suite in the house, and he and the disciples always stay with Mary and Martha. So there is, we're looking at the very beginning of this relationship that Jesus is building with these two sisters, and they become his place when he goes to Jerusalem. So Bethany was really quite a small town. This, of course, this is a picture from the 19, or, uh, late 1800s. Jerusalem, in this case, would be directly off to the right. So you're looking south over the top of Bethany. So a small little village. So with all of that context in mind, I'd like to invite you to either turn with me or listen as I read a portion from Luke chapter 10. So it's only a few verses we're going to start in verse 38. So Luke 10, 38 says, Now as they were traveling along, right, so he's coming up from Jericho, he, meaning Jesus, but it would be Jesus and all of his disciples traveling with him, they enter a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. This is when we all pause and go, Oh, cool. I, or maybe if you're me, you pause and go, oh, cool. This is Martha's house, and Martha is taking agency to offer the kind of hospitality that was a privilege to offer to a traveling rabbi. So it's not, hey, Jesus, as a singular person, you want to come into our house. It's Jesus and your whole retinue, everyone's traveling with you, come and I will give you shelter, I will give you food, we will provide for you, and please make this your house. And we will sit at your feet and learn from you. It's an extreme kind of hospitality that is just so beautiful. So when we continue on, it says, she had a sister called Mary. So we meet Mary, but Mary doesn't speak in this narrative which is okay, we can still learn from Mary. The lack of voice doesn't mean that we don't have anything to say or anything to learn from her. So she had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. And again, she's not being silent, she's being active in the learning process. Now the fact that she's a female sitting at the feet of a rabbi is not a weird thing either. Um, we have several stories in this particular gospel, even, of Jesus teaching crowds of people, and women are there, and women speak up, and they ask questions, and he addresses and interacts with them. So it's this, like, learning space is not a male space. It's for anyone who wants to be a disciple. So if you want to be a disciple, you sit at the feet of Jesus, and you actively engage in the learning process. We don't know how long this teaching has gone on. We don't know if this is several days later. Maybe Jesus has been there many days. Maybe it's been five minutes, 20 minutes, one day, two days. We don't know. But we move on. So in verse 4, it says, But Martha was distracted with all of her preparations. And so before we go on, this is interesting because this is when we start to go, Ah, I can see Luke doing his pair here. Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, Martha distracted. And that is what we're supposed to pay attention to. In this travel narrative, as Jesus has been traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem, he has been sitting and eating with people. Like the whole way through, you read those 10 chapters, and it's meal after meal after meal after meal. And as we sit and we look at what happens in these meals, we sit and we see Jesus interacting with a wide variety of people, teaching them about discipleship. And that's exactly what we have here, except Luke is drawing our attention to there's two kinds of disciples. There's the disciple actively engaged, and there's the disciple who's not doing anything wrong. She's doing what is culturally appropriate in providing extreme hospitality. That's what you do. That is an honor. Except she's distracted by what is culturally appropriate. And so then we get her next statement. She comes up to Jesus in verse 40 and says, 
Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. Right, so there's a couple things here, right? Any of us who have ever provided for a, a large group, we know how exhausting it actually physically can be. And we're like, yeah, I, I get this. Like, I'm a little bit weary. But you also hear in that last statement, Jesus, do you see? And if you see and if you care about me, why don't you do something about it? It's almost this test, right? Do you see that Mary's doing nothing? I'm doing everything. Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus does what Jesus often does throughout all of the gospels. When people challenge him to act the way they assume he's going to act. And he's like, instead, how about if I change your focus to what you should be focusing on? And that's what he does with Martha. In verse 41, but the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary for Mary has chosen the good part, which should not be taken away from her. It's not a reprimand for what she's doing, because Jesus loves her hospitality. Jesus makes use of her hospitality. Jesus needs her hospitality. So it's not a rebuke about what she's doing. It's a rebuke about where her focus is. So in this role of disciple, she's being distracted by what is culturally expected from her instead of keeping her attention fully on Jesus. And there is something so appropriate for us in this. And I heard it even in the testimonies that we heard from the youth when they were talking about distractions of the world, but how they have found this peace that comes from being focused singularly on who Jesus is. And I applaud that. And I think that is absolutely amazing. And I would say everyone in the room probably understands what it means to get distracted. Right? We have, it's like, it's hard to be an adult. Right? I'm always telling you, it's like adulting is so hard. I didn't know it was so hard. Because there are so many things you have to do. You have to provide for your family. You have to be able to pay rent. You have to engage with other people. There's, you have to do so many things. And those are not wrong, but they're wrong if they are your singular focus. And Jesus very gently calls out to people and says, I understand you're weary. I understand that you're distracted, but you should focus on what is singularly important in your life. What is the thing that's going to last forever? And it is sitting at the feet of Jesus, actively engaging this role of discipleship. And as we go forth, there is something of this. It's not a good sister versus a bad sister. It's two disciples giving us two views of what it means to be a disciple. And can we learn from these sisters about what it means to be so singular focused on who Jesus is? Will you pray with me? God, of all who are exhausted by the expectations of other people. God, of those who generously open their homes and offer hospitality to others. God, of people who hunger and thirst for your presence. And God, of the silent, the outspoken, the questioners, the ponderers. Remember your people today. Remember those who selflessly work to improve the lives of others. Remember all of your disciples who passionately study your word. Remember all who struggle to balance all of life's demands. Remember the ones who need a private moment with you to hear you say that they matter. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.